I'd like to welcome you here today for our Book for Lunch program. If you haven't had a chance to treat yourself to cookies and coffee or tea, please just help yourself. And our wonderful friends are continuing to provide us with our refreshments. If, if you ever want to know what's happening in our area, all you have to do is go to our website, www.baycountylibrary.org and hit the Let's Next button, and then you're gonna find all the programs that are here locally in our area and what time that they're gonna be on. Um, we, some of the organizations that are on it are, we're on it, and then the Delta, Plan, uh, Delta Colleges Planetarium is on it, State Theater, amongst other organizations. Now, if you don't have a computer at home, you're welcome to go upstairs to our second floor and we have lots of computers for you to use. And if you need help, we have uh, some wonderful tech pages here. And they can help you if you have any computer needs, you know, if you need help finding anything with the computer. And in case you didn't know that, yes? I still have a question. I know you can find out on the computer. However, it used to be even a blurb in the paper would be nice. Because uh, I'm not always on that computer, but if there's any paper out there, I'm reading it. And there was nothing in the paper this time about when it was going to start. If oh, it was. Mean for our, our for books for, for lunch, lunch, it would have been in our newsletter. Do you get our newsletter? No. Oh, oh no, I want the newspaper. Oh, you want, want the newspaper? Or someplace <laughs> with that I can hear. Okay, I'll pass that on, okay? And, and we'll, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, but anyhow, if, I don't know if everybody knows that the library here at work has computer classes. So if you need some help in developing some computer skills, we'd be happy to help you with those. And my branch, the Auburn branch, also has one-on-one -on -one training for uh, anyone who's interested in doing that. So Next week, the author, Tom Carr, will be here to discuss his book, Blood on the Mitten, Infamous Michigan Murders, 1700s to Present. And we're hoping that you're going to be able to join us for that program. But today, we have Mr. Tom Trombley here to discuss the book, Buildings of Michigan, by Catherine Bishop Eckert. And Mr. Trombley has served as a consultant on several restoration projects, including the Hoyt, Saginaw, uh, Hoyt Library in Saginaw, the Saginaw Art Museum, and the Theodore Ref Refke Childhood Home in Saginaw. And he has been a speaker at several Michigan Historic Preservation Network conferences, and he was the chair of the 2006 conference held in Saginaw. He was the curator of collections at the Historical Society of Saginaw, his history. And for 19 years, he was a construction specialist for the Neighborhood Renewal Services of Saginaw Incorporated. And since 2009, he has taken on the responsibility of being the Deputy Director of the Castle Museum of Saginaw County History. So would you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Trombley. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Let's see, are we going to dim the, we go to dim the lights a little? Yes. I actually haven't given a book review in years, so I, I don't know if I'm going to need the minimum standards of a book report or not. So we'll go back and try to re um, um, recreate those skills we've lost. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I want to make certain because that's important. Um, who has read, has anyone read The Buildings of Michigan? Okay, good. Um, so please do add, I'm very, this is very informal, if you have questions, raise your hand, and then we'll have a discussion period afterwards. Um, the book that I'm going to talk about today is really a guidebook. In a way, it's an architectural Baedeker to Michigan. And so it's one of, it actually worked the way it was supposed to, which is always scary. Um, <laughs> And I don't have my usual IG person that I have at the museum, although you have a good wall, it was great. It's one of several books specifically about the buildings of Michigan. And some of them I just went over to Hoyt Library yesterday and took out my cell phone and took photo, a photograph of some of them. Uh, you know, there's ones that are specifically focused on 
books on specific architects or specific um, themes, but there's also a number of them that deal with this idea of trying to create kind of a catalog of or a guidebook to buildings in Michigan. Um, the one that I first of all was thinking of was Wayne Andrews' uh, book, Architecture of Michigan and Architecture in the Midwest. Mr. An Professor Andrews had been at Wayne State University and was a literature um, instructor. And it's a, it's a very interesting book, not the most comprehensive, but very interesting. Um, their most recent one is Great Architecture of Michigan, which is 100 buildings, and it was by the architectural reviewer of the Detroit Free Press. Um, and then one that I would have brought along a copy, but it, and maybe would have even read it, but it was a little bit thick and heavy, is Hawkins Ferry's Buildings of Detroit. And although it deals specifically with architecture in Detroit, it really relates to a whole history of the state of Michigan. And has anybody read any of those three books? Detroit. Detroit, yeah, which is really a wonderful book. And I was really surprised that it has, been, or pleased to learn that it has been reissued again with a new introduction. The book we're going to talk about is by Catherine Bishop Eckert, and I left my notes someplace, so if I'm off a year or two, I guess it isn't really going to matter, and it might be better to go that way. Anyhow, there's nothing worse than having someone read something to you. Um, Catherine Bishop Eckert um, was the Michigan State Historic Preservation Officer from 1993 to 1997, and the State Historic Preservation Officer is the person that's really um, responsible for overseeing preservation activities in the state of Michigan, both governmental but also leading and driving um, less governmental activities. Catherine's background was she studied at Mount Holyoke, then and then at the University of Michigan, and then her doctorate in American Studies is from MSU. So no matter which party, which team you're up for, <laughs> Catherine, and Catherine's very good at being, um, listening to all sides. Um, I'm going to talk about the 1993 edition of the Buildings of Michigan, but there is, I think it's 2012, there's a more recent edition, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I actually have not read it, and I meant to buy a cop, purchase a copy of it, and I did not do so. But it, no matter what, it's the same book, but there, the 2012 is more expanded, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. She has also written two books. Um, actually, my favorite by her is The Sandstone Architecture of the Lake Superior Region, um, which deals with a specific um, material is a way to look at buildings. Um, in the Marquette area, the sandstone, which is a very deep reddish brown, um, was used extensively in that area of the Upper Peninsula, but we will is used in this area too, and we'll talk about at least one building, and there are some buildings in Bay City that use it as well. Um, and then her other book is a guidebook to the Cranbrook campus. And one of the things we'll see as we go through the, as we discuss the buildings of Michigan did today, but also all of her work, that she's interested in architecture, not just historic architecture, but also contemporary architecture and mid-century modern architecture. And actually, when she wrote the first edition of this, mid-century modern wasn't quite as old as it is today. <laughs> um, we have an exhibit at the museum where I work on mid-century modern architecture that I curated. And I must say, some things seem like my more recent past than they are. Um, Catherine's career and work is very closely aligned to the State Historic Preservation Office. Has anyone, is anyone familiar with the sometimes called the SHPO or SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Officer? Raise your hand if you've had any contact with them. Okay, one of you um, has. Um, it is a state office. It is now under the auspices of the Michigan State Historic, I'm sorry, it's now under the auspices of MISHDA, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. 
Um, but when Catherine was there, it was um, more, it was independent from Mishta. Um, it is, does receive federal government function funding. And it, one of the many things that the office is responsible for is the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, is anyone familiar, I'm certain at least one of you knows what the National Register of Historic Places is. Um, and I think it's really important to just, to understand this because this really structures the buildings that are selected in this book. So often I will get a call at the museum where people will say, oh, my building's old, it must be historic. Or, you know, what is it? It's, you know, don't you list buildings at the museum, which we do not. Um, and the National Register for Historic Places, which on a state level, the State Historic Preservation Officer is responsible, but delegates that responsibility, is, a net, is maintained by the National Park Service. And there's very stringent requirements for listing a building, and there's many buildings in Saginaw and Bay City that are listed. There are other designations that are applied. There are, there's a state um, register of historic places, which is not really active anymore, but was specifically tied to the green markers that you see that there's several in Bay City, and very often buildings are listed on both, but at one time the state markers required listing on to get those signs. And when Catherine was at the State Historic Preservation Officer, was the State Historic Preservation Officer, that those signs were operated through the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, there also are locally designated historic districts, and I know in Bay City Center Avenue, and I think their Midland Avenue is a form of a locally designated historic district, and those are set up locally and afford the most um, protection for buildings. The National Register only protects buildings if federal funds are under use. So if there was a federal re rehabilitation program, or if there was a highway going through, those would come under place. So other than that, it's somewhat honorary, but there's a very complex government process, which is not detailed in her book, but it's alluded to in her book. But for us, the important part of the National Register, not only for Catherine's background, for understanding what books were selected for the buildings of Michigan, it's really based on the National Register listing. So, there are many worthy buildings, which this book would be much thicker of every building in Michigan. It would be several volumes that was interesting or worthy, um, would be much thicker, but it's really based on the National Register District, um, the National Register nomination. So some of them um, is that are in Bay City are the Bay City Downtown Historic District, Bay City Masonic Temple, Bay County Building, the Center Avenue Neighborhood Residential District, um, <coughs> Bay City City Hall, of course, the James Clement Airport. Um, and then these are just more of the ones, as I promised, I wouldn't force you to listen to me read. Um, <laughs> in Saginaw, it's the Behringer Building, Bliss Park, um, the Abel Brockway House, um, there are, there's an archaeological site which the locations for those are not covered in Catherine's book and aren't usually aren't listed for the protection of the site. And of course, last for my list but not least is the Castle Station or the Castle Post Office where the, the museum where I work is housed. Um, the book is part of a series published by the Society of Architectural Historians, which is a national organization uh, that is, how low, is headquartered in Chicago in a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but it's a national organization. There is a Michigan chapter, and I was a past president of it. We haven't met in a number of years. Um, but these guidebooks, which um, the idea is, I think, that there would be one for all 50 states, but several have been published. Catherine's was the first, the 19th, the one, the Buildings of Michigan, that was published. And they are really meant to be a guidebook. 
Now, the, as I said, there is a new edition, but there also is an, an online version of this, which is not fully available without a very expensive subscription. So for there's three, you can see the updated version, but you can see uh, about three or four buildings for each community when you go in. I know the City Hall, the Castle Building, Hoyt Library is not. Um, but it really is nice. Um, and for those of you who are talking about print versus online sources, this is a good example. It's very flexible, so you can bring up a region and then, um, well, I don't know why I selected the Castle Museum. <laughs> um, I promise not to make it to, you know, because this is really a way to look at this. We have a common heritage in this area. So I could spend some, talk about some Bay City sites, but also some Saginaw stories. And it comes up with a concise history that's very similar to what's in the 1883 bill, um, in 1890, 93 edition, those eights and nines are going to get me every time today. Um, but it also is almost probably identical to what you get in the $80 edition today, but you don't get the full thing. Um, and in the buildings of Michigan, and I have not copied the photographs, but most of the photographs in the book were taken by Balthasar Korab, um, who was uh, uh, just a real, who no, just died a few couple years ago. This is his um, 2013 obituary for the New York Times, based in the Detroit area. He was a brilliant photographer. And actually, when this book was, when the first edition of her book came out, there was a traveling exhibit based on the photographs. Um, it had actual prints by Balthasar Korab. Um, in it, and that is um, a house, I think, in Albion from the book, and this is another one. And his photographs are used to illustrate the website. Um, it's interesting to see this is where, you know, online versus print things kind of are fun to check. It was interesting when I was doing my research for this that um, uh, in it uses it as their listing as a, as a means of promoting themselves. They have a photograph of the cover of the book and note that they are listed in the book. And obviously, because this is just a screenshot, I can't click it, but it will actually take you to their listing. Um, one of the things that Catherine sets in the introduction, it's really designed and it is laid out as a travel guide. So it has sites in it, um, and it's broken into regions. And some of the times, the way the regions are broken down aren't exactly the way I drive, and I don't usually carry mine with me, but it isn't always exactly the route I pass, but you can find things regionally. But the introduction is really quite wonderful. And in it, she describes really the forces that shape Saginaw. Um, and I didn't realize when I was putting this together earlier this week that this photograph I selected of Lake Michigan on a windy day was going to be so appropriate. Um, it was, it's a beach in Saugatuck a few years ago when I stood out there and took the photo and it felt like I was going to be blown away and it still wasn't. Um, but what things she talks about are what shapes Michigan because this is one of the things that Catherine is very interested in, the forces that really shape buildings. It does deal with style, what's a Queen Anne style building, what's a mid-century modern building, but she also talks about both the political process of why a building came to be, but also in Michigan, the forces that really have shaped the community. Of course, the Great Lakes are a, a are an overwhelming influence on us, especially with weather like we've had. It focuses, well the building doesn't, doesn't really, it focuses on buildings that still stand. It's not a guidebook to build it, to make it lots and the glories that work, but she also alludes to what has been lost and what is invisible. And when she talks about the natural resources, she also talks about the Native American settlement in this area that goes back 12,000 years, but really isn't that visible. Um, and isn't always evident when you look at the structures that are here today. So, but that's a very important part of the introduction, but also the natural resources that are in Michigan. Um, she talks about the early settlement of the area, and of course, um, 
distantly related, if you caught my name, um, uh, we all have ancestors from Detroit and Bay City, um, is the Trombley Center House. And it's one of that part of the kind of East Coast tradition that the early European settlers constructed in, in this area. There are a couple of Greek revival houses from a few years later left in Saginaw, but most of that would be replaced or so heavily reconstructed it's hard to find. But it talks about that tradition moving forward. She talks about extensively really that relationship to natural, and I keep dwelling on that, but it's so important, really the natural resources that really shaped Michigan's um, buildings. And of course, it's logging, and you probably have a book like this for Bay City. This was published in 1889, and this is the industries of the Sagnas, the Sagnas, East Sagnas, Sagna City had just been consolidated, and it's also the end of the lumbering period. But lumbering, of course, was such a dominant force in Michigan, and it really shaped an architectural tradition that We'll talk a little bit about more about a story in Saginaw in a few minutes, but really that use of wood and the availability of wood really shape. And also there's really, climatically with white pine, there's really, um, there, it, it re is reflected in the settlement patterns of the state. So they're all really kind of mixed together. And that is not an, an OSHA-approved load of logs. <laughs> I, I read through one of my lumbering photographs, and I'm not certain that that was the best one. Uh, and you know, I could all along the Saginaw River is really um, this type of. This isn't far. This is in Saginaw, but I could have found a similar wharf of, of, of lumber being ready to ship in the 1880s. But it not only gave rise to, to incredible fortunes, livelihoods for people who worked in the woods and the sawmills, but also gave rise to really some great homes. Um, I could have, I just happened to select one from Jefferson Avenue in Saginaw. I could have selected from Bay City that's a couple blocks from the museum. Um, and it also, I've alluded to the danger with working out without notes. Yes, and sometimes you end up with a little summer rerun, but this is really an important point. This use of natural materials really shaping the community. And in Michigan, we, I mentioned the Forty Gentry or the Marquette Sandstone, which some is used at the Masonic Temple in Saginaw Point <coughs> Library. And it's a very distinctive reddish stone, but also there's the Bayport stone, which she doesn't talk about very, I don't think she even mentions, but the quarries in Bayport, Michigan, were developed by Saginaw, um, de, uh, Saginaw investors. And it's interesting how there definitely are Bayport stone buildings in Bay City, but we have a lot more in Saginaw, even though it's further away. But the reason was because there were investors from Saginaw, you know, they, it's a good way to make certain your product is seen. Um, and Hoyt Library right next door on Jefferson Avenue, right next door to the, muse the Castle Museum, uses both Portage Entry Sandstone and Bayport Stone. Um, and actually one of the original chair of the Board of Trustees where the building was constructed um, was one of the main pushers of the quarries at Bayport. She also talks in the introduction, then mentions a couple of times in the book, the catalog housing industry in this area. And it's easy, I, as, and my title's changed since I said in, I'm now the vice president and chief historian at the Castle Museum. But one of the things that we always have to do, we do serve as a very specifically uh, a political be, um, outline, a county of Saginaw, and so I always, when we're doing exhibits, I always try to neatly end the story at the county line and say, continue your search at the next county, that that might continue. But sometimes um, that is, you know, and this is one of the things getting ready for this, that it's sometimes too easy to overlook that kind of 
cross regional development, which really is what had happened in the 19th and 20th centuries, or it, thousands of years before that, before there were political counties. But the Aladdin home industry wasn't the only, and she alludes to this, it talks about this in her introduction, the Saginaw had its own um, manufactured housing industry as well. Um, it was a much more fragile industry. It was the Mershon Morley Portable House Industry. Has anybody ever heard of it? It was, um, rather than being a pre-cut home, and there were some homes in Saginaw that were pre-cut, Mershon Morley Portable Homes were penalized construction. And I looked far and hard because a lot of times they were sold for hunting cabins, um, mining communities, uh, cottages, and I found a garage that I'm pretty certain is by them. And they were, uh, we've had some calls from people who have one on the other side of the country. I mean, they were shipped all over the country. They weren't as large in the land home, but very prosperous, very successful. It was made in the, the factory was in Carlton, just beyond the city dim limits in Saginaw. And this is their catalog. Um, they, unlike Aladdin, who had 20 feet of lumber, the, you know, that whole idea of industrialization and cutting. I love this, how this word grows up. That's from the Aladdin catalog. Um, but the Mershon Morley Portable Houses, and I'm just going to talk for a second about them, because Catherine mentions them and does, built these really wonderful panelized um, houses. And this is one that has survived at Cottage Grove in Higgins Lake. It was a Saginaw family. And you can see how they're actually bolted together. Um, I fell on the last piece of ice last week, so sorry for my slowness here. But see how this is? Um, a unit. So you should actually be able to take one down and reassemble it. And they're absolutely wonderful. Um, and this is the interior because the interior was finished as well. And it is out of focus, I apologize. Um, but it's, you know, they're very fragile, and you, once they get covered up, you wouldn't know them. And they're not as, you know, the Aladdin Homes designs, there are Aladdin Homes in Saginaw, we don't have anything quite as wonderful as Fifth Avenue for Aladdin Homes, but I do find some occasionally, and it appears that there may have been a couple of builders in Saginaw who bought an Aladdin home catalog but didn't want to pay for the kit and decided they, they could. And sometimes when I was doing work for NRS, there was one contractor that I think didn't quite understand how to put them together. So he did his own knockoffs. Um, and this is just the patent, how the houses go together. And what's so odd is I always think it's going to be a four by eight module, and it's not, which is a sheet of plywood. I was going to someday I'm going to do a mock-up of one. And um, but um, you know, it really, what I thought we'd start. This is supposed to be marked. I'm supposed. I think as part of my book reviewer duties, I'm supposed to read a little from you so you get an idea of how the book is written, not me just rambling on. Uh, so I thought I would start with some of the things, and I am not going to, don't panic, I'm not covering every building that's in the book, I'm just kind of giving you an idea for region, because what I thought I'd do, this book covers the whole state of Michigan, but by just, I thought I'd just look at the listings for Saginaw and Bay City and just select a couple of them, so we get kind of an idea of the flavor, and I think one of my duties as a book reviewer is to have you check, I think I get extra points if you check out the, if you have the 2012 edition. Um, she first of all, and I, um, has a very factual a number, and there's a map that denotes where it's located, um, and so it gives the years it was constructed, 1894 to 1897. These buildings usually don't go up in one year. Leverett A. Platt and Walter, Walter Kepi on 301 South Washington and gives the instructions how to do there. Led by Alterman Kronicke, voters, and I'm sorry, my name pronunciation is not going to be perfect. Voters approved in 1889 a bond issue to erect a modern new building to satisfy the needs of a growing and prosperous city. They conceived of an office for all time, a building whose capacity and convenience could never be overtaxed 
and which would be both a credit and an ornament to the city. The Bay City Hall is a massive and magnificent public monument designed in the Richardsonian Romanesque style, and there is a back, in the back there is a, a dictionary or a glossary that defines style types, so don't panic if you don't know the style. Made famous by H.H. H. Richardson, it has wide rounded arches, deeply recessed windows, and a multi-gabled red tiled roof. Its corner clock and bell towers soar 180 feet above the east bank of the Saginaw River to, in a gesture of civic, civic spirit and pride. The city built, this is bifocals influencing my reading, the city hall is constructed of granite and of light gray, yellowish brown, Berea sandful, sandstone quarried at Amherst, Ohio. Inside, a grand atrium extends from the ground floor some 65 feet to a huge skylight. And she just goes on to talk about the building. And I just, this is from the online version and just some photos of it. You really get an idea and really want to go see the building. Um, in Sagna, one of the grand monuments she talks about is the castle building. Whose bench the museum I'm from? And if I ever come back here again, I have brochures here. I should have brought some hats for you. Um, the castle building um, was dedicated in 1898 and was a federal post office. Sagna was the third largest city in Michigan at that time and was very represented in Congress and we were able to get a very good appropriation for a post office. Um, in 1937, it was more than doubled in size. The people of Sagna, the building was threatened with demolition. Um, there was a public outcry, and what resulted was an enlargement of the building. And you may wonder why our building looks like a French chateau. It was to honor the French heritage of the community. At that time, the government had a policy of modeling buildings after to reflect the heritage of the community. Um, in Saginaw, our city hall, we had, she had a grand Romanesque revival city hall that was destroyed in a great fire on April 9, 1935. And actually, it was slightly larger than the one in Bay City, finished a couple of years earlier. And the atrium, um, there's very vivid descriptions of the glass collapsing over the light cord during the fires. That was before sprinkling was installed. And so what we ended up with is a rather wonderful, although not quite as grand, building constructed at Bayport Stone. It was by the local architect Carl May Cumber. And Catherine describes in her book kind of the forces that shaped it as a WPA building. And actually, it will be its 80th birthday this November. And I'm doing a piece to, for the um, for the YouTube chat uh, to go on YouTube for the city uh, about the history of it. And actually, as a sign that's not covered in Catherine's book, the paneling in the council chambers, I believe, was made by Westover Cam in Bay City. Um, and of course, there's your own um, county building, which, I mean, I'm glad I didn't try to take a photo. It's much better to just look out the window when you're leaving and look at it. And so I just went online and did a screenshot. Um, she goes into the forces that shape two libraries, and your Sag and Bay are very fortunate that we each have these 19th century libraries, which were considered a perfect gift to a community to really to memorialize yourself. Sage, which is, I think, 1883-1884, designed by a local architect, um, I think it was Pratt, and then Hoyt in Saginaw, which we saw the photos made of Bayport Stone and Lake Superior, printed with Lake Superior red sandstone, was a gift from the, to the city of Saginaw from a man who never lived in Saginaw, but was a major force. Jesse Hoyt, his family, um, was really the, were the financiers that laid out the city of East Saginaw. And she does talk, Catherine talks about that in her introduction. And, um, at the end of his life and his will, he left $100,000 for the founding of a, of a non-circulating reference library that didn't open until 1890. Um, Sage actually was influenced um, by Hoyt's gift, but his was completed much more quickly than Hoyt Library, which the board um, went through a very long process. And it's a building that's um, 
that has served the community very well and really talks about those materials um, that are used locally. It was designed, Hoyt was designed by an East Coast architect, Henry Van Brun from Boston, who was not used to working with the smaller units of Bayport stone and the Lake Superior red sandstone. And I don't think was particularly, from what I found in the correspondence, was particularly pleased that the board had forced him um, to use it, although he came up with a rather wonderful design. Um, Saginaw's Waterworks um, is by Victor Andre Matson, and it is, although the building is a collegiate Gothrin building, which a friend of mine from England once said, the only decent building in town, it looks like a university, and turns out to be the water treatment plant. <laughs> um, she actually said that, it was a great line. Um, and she was an architectural historian who couldn't stand buildings. Um, and <laughs> that's a whole other story. But actually, it's so it, it always seems like there's no kind of function to the building, form follows function. Actually, the tower, if you're familiar with the building, has a function. It holds a huge water tank that's used for backwashing the filters when they need to be cleaned. Um, so, and Catherine goes into that in her book. Um, and she talks at length about districts because that's how historic districts are late created. Groups of building in Bay City, of course, Center Avenue, which is such a wonderful grand avenue. But she also talks um, in Sagra, and I just did some screenshots, which don't do justice. She talks, of course, about the Aladdin home on the villa that's on Center Avenue. But in Sagna, she talks about South Jefferson Avenue, two houses, one that's privately owned and being restored slowly, the Hill House. And then the other one she talks about is the, the Passalt home, which is actually where the Historical Society of Sagna County had its first meeting. It's again a private, not first museum, not meeting. And it's again a private home. But one of the things, and um, you know, we're supposed to point out the positive things about books and you know, some of the difficulties, is that because in many ways Catherine is editing um, stories from local communities, sometimes as I was reading it, I discovered some of those local stories get caught up in her book, and she has no way to really check everything for thousands, for probably, there's probably over 1,500 entries in here. And with the Passel Home, and I must confess, the organization that I worked for back in the 60s had a slightly romantic interpretation of the history of the house. Um, the house was constructed and also made the house a little older than it is. It was designed by Ludwig Volusen Buddha, who was Sagna's first professional architect, or one of its first. One should always be careful saying first because you can propagate inferior information that way. Um, but it also survived a great fire in Sagna. On May 20th, 1893, at the very end of the lumbering period, a spark fell into, if you know Sagna at all, where in Jibwe Island is today, there were mills. It was called the Middle Ground. And there was an abandoned working mill there. There was still a working mill, but there was also an abandoned mill on, and some other buildings on the island. A spark launched in an abandoned mill. The wind, which was like we had on Tuesday, Wednesday, um, spread the burning boards into the river that led lodged under a bridge. And by the time three hours um, was had passed, um, over two over three hundred buildings had been destroyed in almost two hundred and fifty homes. We did an archaeological dig on one of the basements a few years ago, but. That's a plug for the museum. This is the story of Catherine's book. But the story is this house was fireproof and it survived the fire of 1893. Um, and this is the story. Um, so, and that it, the story even went further that Mr. Castle, who made his money through soap, not through lumber, always thought the lumbermen were careless and would burn the city down. Um, and so the story through the years was promoted that it was a fireproof house and that it had survived the fire. Well, within the, 
in the 90, late 90s, Neighborhood Renewal Services owned the house and I put a roof on it and I had a call from the contractor um, and said, what do you want me to do about, we need to, you need to come over and we need to discuss the fire damage. And, and so what evolved was a very different understanding of the history of the house, which I already was suspicious of and I wasn't working for the museum at the time. So, um, but what evolved was when you read the, the newspaper accounts for the fire, the house was actually located on the very edge. It would be located on this bottom edge. I won't walk in front of the screen, but it would have been located on that bottom edge on the southern boundary of the fire. And it was heavily damaged by the fire. And actually, when we were doing work on it, the servants' quarters in the back, the roof must have been completely charred. Um, one of the porches, you literally could see where they had sistered joints onto the burn joists to try to um, strengthen it so and to repair it. So what about wasn't a fireproof house, was a house that survived only because it was on a high bluff overlooking the major thing on the very edge of the fire. And actually, they probably were able to stand on the roof and beat embers out, but still couldn't completely keep it. So it wasn't a fireproof house at all. So, uh, you know, it's one of the things that always makes me realize being very careful when you share these stories, because they develop and take on a life of their own. And this is just the ruins of Saginaw after the fire um, on May 20th, 1893. And those are actually tours from probably from Detroit, but you could take an excursion train out here. Other major buildings on Jefferson Avenue are this wonderful church by Gordon Lloyd um, and the house that we looked at earlier, which is by a Detroit, uh, I'm sorry, by a Chicago architect, George Beaumont. And it's interesting, I mean, it, it, she picks up a couple of buildings and then it's kind of a gateway for you to find it in the case of both Jefferson Avenue and Century Avenue in Bay City. There are local walking tours which allow for somebody to find more information. Um, one of the other things she deals with in Saginaw are some independent um, homes. This is the Clark Lombard Green Mansion by Charles Adams Platt of 1904. This is the restored garden a few years ago. It has a contemporary wing on it now. It is the Saginaw Art Museum. Um, she also talks about the Grove in Saginaw, which is bound by City Hall. And she talks about the history of the Montague Inn, which is by Franz and Spence of Saginaw. And it was constructed for Edwina um, and Robert Montague. And he, they had made their money through um, sugar beet uh, production, or sugar production from beets, not sugar beet. Um, of course, I always like to think of building as its landmarks, and this postcard of Saginaw has some of the built, very buildings that Catherine talks about. Um, the Bankrupt Hotel, which is by an architect from Chicago, um, and then the Second National Bank building, which is by Wirt Rowland, um, Smith, Hinchman, and Grills, which is one of the great landmarks of downtown Saginaw and by the same architect is the Michigan Bell Building. And I don't know, she doesn't cover who your Michigan Bell Building is by, and I've always meant to check that. I assume it's Smith, Inchman, and Grills as well, but it's really a really great Art Deco building, and there's a book coming out in, later this year that will feature chapters on each of those buildings. Um, one of the things about Catherine's book is, like all good guidebooks, like the Baedeker guides that are so famous, that it should cause you to start to look for more. That if I go to a community and do my research first, and actually it's one of the few books I haven't carried with me and it doesn't show the wear of my book bag as badly as some, um, but is that, that interconnectedness <coughs> between communities and a continuing story and to start look beyond. Of course, Alvin B. Dow, who's from Midland, but there are great buildings by Dow in both Bay City and in Saginaw and in Midland. Um, in Bay City, you have the, on, on, on Center Avenue, the Masonic Temple, not the Masonic, uh, the Temple Israel, gosh, I that one, I apologize. And then 
Uh, around the corner from that, a few blocks, there are the two homes for the default members of the default shipbuilding family. In Saginaw, we have um, a house that Alder B. Dow designed for his sister, a retired librarian. Um, it was designed for his aunt, Herbert Dow's sister, who was a retired librarian and asked his nephew to design a small house that acted like a, that acted as a big house. In the 1950s, it was um, attached to the Congregational Church, um, but the interior remains intact, almost like a period room, and the church has done some restoration work on it, and it's really an enchanting building. Um, and it's um, you, this retired librarian, um, you can just picture it, she's seated at the uh, tea that she held for a church when the house was done. She's seated with a lace collar and an 18th century Scottish tea service in her ultra with the newspaper dumped her ultra modern house. Oh. And it, it's on two le three levels. And the bedroom, there's two bedrooms on the upper level with doors that open so you can have um, this space between the bedrooms and the living area are open. It's really a great house. And some that aren't included in Catherine's book. This is at Northwood um, University. It's one. It's their meeting spot, and it's just really a very vibrant and magical Alden B. Dow space. Um, you know, one of the other things to look at. One of the architects from Bay City that I'm so interested in is Joseph. And I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing it right. I, you know, I'm north of here, so my pronunciation. Joseph Gadeen from the Hardware family, um, who did quite a bit of work in Saginaw as well as Bay City. Uh, and of course, one of the great buildings that she mentions, which I have to go look at the outside sometime, is the Besser home in Alpena by Gadeen. And you find this kind of traveling of, our, our, of, of the influence of Bay City and Saginaw and Midland throughout the state. Um, and you know, really one of the things that Catherine's book really does make you want to do, as all good guidebooks do, is to really look at the sources that are available. And Joseph Gadeen's papers are at the Clark Historical Library at CMU. Um, so if you have some questions about some of his buildings, that might be a good place to go. And you know, I have to do some more research. This is a, church, a Catholic church in Carleton he designed, and this is one in the city of Saginaw he designed. And you can really see, when you think of like this family's hardware store on Bay City, you can see that Art Deco influence in both of them, both in St. Helens and, once again, without my notes, I'm hopeless. Um, but the other thing that to look at, sometimes she highlights one part, but it opens a gateway to others. Um, the one listing she has in the 1993 edition for W.T. Cooper, who was a fairly prominent Sagan architect during the, um, the latter part of the 19th century and early 20th century, is his addition to the Eddy Building, which is on the corner of Genesee and Washington. It's now a completely full apartment building, um, but he added um, two stories to the top of the building, which, um, and the reason she selected that as the representative work for Cooper was because it had been listed in the 70s in the Nash, on the National Register as part of the work that had made it at that time into um, assisted part, uh, ap living apartments and is now market rate apartments. But um, so it kind of skewed what she listed. In, in Saginaw, when we think of Cooper, we think of some of his grander buildings, the city hall that burned the, Sa the east side or Saginaw Club that's right next door to the Temple Theater. But also in Bay City, he's the designer of the Paramarket Depot. Um, so it's this kind of, uh, like all guidebooks, we should look at it as kind of a gateway to looking to larger things, to larger stories. And kind of as a closure, um, I wanted to kind of mention the one thing is that you should always um, don't discount some of the newer buildings. The one on the lower right is one of the listings that has been lost in Saginaw. It is a 1970s federal building. It was an experimental building done in the mid-70s. It actually replaced the castle building 
and it was somewhat below ground with berms and was not greatly beloved. But I must say, the last time I worked at the museum, on a hot summer day, it was my very favorite place to have lunch. There was a rooftop terrace that I greatly miss. And although we still, we restored Jeffers Park recently, which is just across the street from it, it doesn't, it's just not a place when we go during lunch and, and have lunch. This was removed from the city, but still very open. And the sculpture by Susan Holt that was on the roof called Annual Ring was saved and has been relocated to Saginaw Valley State University. One of the things that I'll just kind of end with too is that most of the photographs in the book are by Balthazar Korat, but occasionally she will use an historic photograph. And unless you check the credits, it can be a little confusing. So the photograph she has of the castle building actually shows it as it was originally constructed. And it's a period photograph, I think, by the Detroit Publishing Company, if I recognize it correctly, which is in the Library of Congress's collection. So it's not always clear with that. But it's actually an excellent book. And I promise to finish my homework and go buy the, the 2012 revitalization <laughs> that I actually um, I had given Catherine quite a bit of information about Saginaw buildings for it, and then never read it. I sent her an email a while ago and said, when is it coming out? She said, it's been out for several years. <laughs> um, it, so I have brochures about the museum. The book, Buildings of Michigan, is easy to find. If you can find it, check with your helpful librarian. And you do have it, I believe, in your library. And I believe you have the 2012 edition. With that, are there questions I can answer or comments? Or is somebody harboring a Mershon Morley portable garage? <laughs> My board doesn't like the idea. I don't, well, we've never discussed it, but I'd love to get a small enough one and have it in the collection. But we don't have that big because they actually can knock it down and store it. Um, yes? You didn't mention a wonderful event, Jazz on Jefferson which I am the coordinator of, um, and which thank you. Um, and this is not to be self-promotional or promotional for the museum in Saginaw, although we can. Um, Jazz and Jefferson is on Jefferson Avenue in Saginaw. It's on June 7th, where, and it really showcases the art and architecture of the buildings of Jefferson Avenue and the vibrant institutions. It's free, open to the public, um, runs from 4.45 to 8 o'clock in the evening. I guess I'm getting ready to start doing news comments on it again. Um, we're finalizing the lead act, which is at 8 o'clock in the evening. And we'll probably, my guess is, we're going to have a mid-century modern walking tour called Modern Jefferson Avenue to comment, to kind of highlight some of the two of the churches have really great mid-century modern additions. The library has one, which is one of the most controversial 50 years later, 50 years later, still a controversial addition. And um, there also is a really great building by Alden B. Dow from the 1960s on Jefferson. Thank you for, for mentioning that. And I hope you enjoy and attend and enjoy attending. Yes? What about St. Mary's Hospital is down there in Jefferson? Yeah, and St. Mary's Hospital is on Jefferson Avenue, um, and it is not mentioned in the buildings of Michigan. One of the things you'll notice between, if you read both the 1983 and, 19, and 20, 1993, my gosh, I can't get those dates right today, uh, the original and the revised edition, Jefferson Avenue no longer goes all the way through. St. Mary's um, Hospital, which has been an, an integral part of the community, but did um, did decide that they wanted to close Jefferson, which has been both, we lost, we lost several historic buildings in the process, but it did keep St. Mary's with a vibrant campus. The one thing is it means you have to gerrymander around, and St. Mary's has some 1920s parts, but it is not, doesn't have anything really older than that, and the 20s part are pretty, subtle and hard to find in the building, you have to know it. So Catherine, the building really focuses on not just community stories and buildings that were there, but it focuses on the buildings that are still existent. Yes? What about the, what, what's the status now of the Mud House? Was it torn down? Um, the Mud House, I think it's the, um, Tom Mud was involved with, but it, Dr. Mud's house is lived in by his son. It's in very good condition. 
One of the houses Tom Mudd had been involved in might have been Rosemary DeJessero's house on Washington Avenue, and that is still in limbo. It's a major restoration project, and nobody stood for, come forward yet. Does that? Yes. I work at SASA in Saginaw, and I noticed that Jack Rabbit's <coughs> tower is still up. Is that something that's been You know, the Jack Rabbit, yeah, there is always talked about. Tom Mudd was instrumental in having it relit. It had been out for a number of years. The problem is that it's a very fragile, complicated neon sign that is much higher above the ground. I've seen photographs in the roof of the grain elevator, and frankly, I never desire or intend to go to the roof of the grain elevator. <laughs> so, uh, so right now, it seems unfeasible that we like it, and it is very sad. I really miss. Um, as I called him, Hoppy. Um, and it was the world's large, I mean, these first in these stories, it's the world's largest neon jackrabbit sign. <laughs> um, so part of, there has been talk of trying to recreate it in, um, in LED. Now, one of the complicated parts of it is the ownership of the grain elevator. Tom had permission from the owner to do, to relight the sign. But it also is, a, it's just catwalks up there that allow to service it. And so like in a storm like we had, or especially in the winter, the ice would bring sections down. Yes? The other question I had is my dad, when we came over from Germany, used to work at Land Ready Pet Homes in okay. Bay City. And I saw the pictures you had of those pre-cut those pre homes. They weren't insulated very well, were they? No. No, and the one, the Rash um, actually the Rashawn Morley, purely it's not, and is um, a summer home behind a larger summer home. It's their guest cottage. Um, you know, but all 19th century homes, I live in an 1893 home, and I mean, it's not well insulated, but you know, there's sweaters for that. <laughs> but it is an issue, and there are, but also constructing from ground up, so, and there are ways to do it energy conservation, sometimes not as draconian as they have to, that are. And that's a non-answer to two very good questions. <laughs> um, and see if somebody can, else can give me a question I can avoid answering. <laughs> yes? What's the name of that end that's on the cover of the book? Um, that actually, I don't know that it's a bed and breakfast, it's in, um, It's in Bel Air, and it's the Henry Riccardi home. And I'm not certain if it is open or not as an inn, and that may have changed. Sometimes that's the one interesting thing, and such as like Bay City City Hall, even the 2012 edition is going to be out of step. Or like our building, we've done further restoration on the castle building since then. So, you know, when you go there, you may find a building, oh, we hope in most cases that has advanced further than when the original or even the 2012 edition, but sometimes you will very shockingly find a vacant spot where there had been a great roof garden. It looks like the Victorian Inn, my two sisters and I, we stayed there. It was a bed, bed and breakfast. Was it in Bel Air? Yeah. It was okay. In Bel Air. Okay. I have to, I didn't, that's a good question, and that one I can't even find a non-answer for but I will uh, I will I will check because I it is a great house and it um, the new one has a lot the new edition has a light house on the cover. Anything else? Yes. Are there lots of pictures in the book? There are lots. Um, it is not the online version would have more um, but the page almost every page some of them are not it's not a coffee table book. Right. It, you know, I classify, I mean, it's very much, it's not even, I call it an end table book, one that has glossy <laughs> pictures with less text, and I try never to go by below, uh, always uh, end table or, or higher, never coffee table. Um, so this is definitely a bookshop book, but it has, the photos are great, and those of us that are extremely nearsighted, the little illustrations, we take our glasses off and look at the details. <laughs> But the text is wonderful. Any other questions? With that, I have met my time limit of 1 o'clock. Thank you so much.
Um, here, if you would like some brochures on the Castle Museum, 